Okay, so now the questions and tomorrow night I will be giving the talk in uh, the Dhammaloka temple. So Ajahn Bamali will come to be my replacement to answer every question you may ever have. So here we go. Questions here. Da, da, da. This is one here. This is the most interesting one. <laughs> da, da, da. Here we go. No, you go. How do I effectively how do I effectively accept someone as they are? You got no choice. <laughs> I am intellectually prepared to do so, but find it hard to practice. So then you're not really intellectually prepared. You know, if you're intellectually prepared, you will go into your emotions, into your practice, and you will do as you think. Please provide some tips to start this process. P.S. Apologize for this medium as paper is scarce. It is a direct result of your brilliant story. <laughs> that was the one about how to let go of the past. You know, write it on brown ink on a piece of paper. And then, in the toilet. What was the question again? It was the... <laughs> it was the um, accept someone as they are. A lot of times, uh, if we want to change somebody and make them different, then you just, it's, what is it? It's like um, one of Ajahn Chah's stories. Once there was a farmer and he had a duck and he wanted the duck to be a chicken <laughs> and he had a lot of suffering. End of story. <laughs> and isn't that crazy? You want to be a, a, you've got a duck and you want the duck to be a chicken? Ducks are ducks, chickens are chickens. Doesn't matter how much you want them to change, the duck will always go quack quack. So the same. Sometimes we want we have a husband, and we want him to be, you know, like um, Brad Pitt or something. You can't have that. And that's just who they are. So you got to accept people as they are, because there's no way of changing. It's like having a duck be a chicken. You just can't do it. It's suffering. And after a while you think, my goodness, why do we keep trying to change people? So, if you don't try and change people, you love them who they are. Remember that story I said yesterday about Kuan Yin and the mother-in-law inside? <laughs> and then your attitude changes. So you can't change people, you can't change the world, but my goodness, you can change your attitude towards the world. And when you can change your attitude to the world, attitude towards other people, attitude towards yourself, then the world changes. Would you consider having Mandarin translation for your teachings or have Mandarin subtitles on the teachings which are available on YouTube so that non-English speaking practices can benefit from your wonderful teaching? Thank you. Somebody has done that in Brazilian. They sent a... Uh, no, in Portuguese. They sent uh, a... A request, you know, with one of my talks on YouTube, subtitled in Portuguese, and asked, you know, is it okay we can use this? And straight away we thought, well, what are you subtitling? We don't know what Portuguese is. So we got somebody who we respect, we've known for a long time, he checked it and said it's a reasonably good translation. So now you can get the talks YouTube subtitled, you know, into Portuguese. So, go and do it, subtitle it into Mandarin. And Sinhala, and uh, English, because <laughs> it's Australian. Yes, it's a good, good idea, so just go and do it. We have a rule in Bodhinyana Monastery on the opposite side of the road. If you have an idea and a suggestion and it's accepted, then you have to do it. <laughs> so whoever wrote this, you have to do it. Dear Ajahn, some I tried doing a bit of metta to myself just then and only felt it through the left side of my body. Is that sort of phenomena common or what's its cause? Do you have any tips uh, regarding doing metta to oneself? Only on one side of the body. Oh, what's that story about the man who had an accident? And you know, he, he had to have, amputate his left arm and his left leg. 
And the doctor said, don't worry, you'll be all right. Uh. <laughs> don't worry, you will be all right. <laughs> oh, it's hopeless, you guys. <laughs> so you've only done it to the left side of your body. So you are not all right. <laughs> oh, you know, sometimes we warm up the left side and then we turn it over, just like making toast. So, you know, you turn it over so the other side gets done. <laughs> That's the only way you can do it. How does seeing non-self end rebirth? Because once you see there's no one there, there's no one to get reborn again anymore. So, that's the end of rebirth. You only want to you get reborn because you want to. Do you really want to get reborn again? Really? Imagine. You've got to have that thing stuck in your mouth again every time you want something. You're trying to tell your mummy there's something important and all she does is oh. <laughs> and you're going to poo in your pants again and you're going to have to go, imagine, going to school again. Oh, not again. So much stuff you think, you know, you, you think you've got over that, you've got past that, but no. You're going to have to do it all over again. Just like that stories which I have about there's three people, now four people I know, <coughs> who apparently when they were first born, spoke. First time this happened was, it was here actually in Nolamara Temple. A couple came to see us and their little child, they had two babies, or two children, sorry, two boys, one was about two or three, the other one had just been born, just come back from the hospital. And one evening, they were Australians, and one evening they told their eldest son, which was something like um, Peter, go and say goodnight to your baby brother Paul. You know, it was in this sort of little um, cot, whatever. And so the little two or three year old leant over the cot and said, goodnight Paul. And Paul said, goodnight Peter. <laughs> it's only a, you know, a few days old. And this couple, they both heard it and they just could not believe what they'd heard. You know, a little baby speaking. And so they stopped what they were doing and they just stared. And without any prompting, their two-year-old said again, Good night, Paul. And this time they were both paying full attention and they heard their little baby say a second time, Good night, Peter. And they were so shocked, they came to see, I don't know why, they came to see the Buddhist monks the next day. <laughs> Even though they're not Buddhists. You know, some people understand that, you know, these Buddhists, we, we've got the goods on all this reincarnation <laughs> business. We understand what's going on. And interesting, they said, when this little, maybe five, ten days old baby spoke, it was not in baby speech, it was like in adult speech. You know, because when a baby talks, they're very high-pitched when they first start talking. But this was like an adult speech, but coming out of a baby's mouth. And when I told that story, a Malaysian couple came up to me, and they said the same happened to them. They never told anybody because they thought if they said what they'd heard, their baby spoke when it was first born, they think they were crazy, and no one would take them seriously. They said it was absolutely true. I know the couple, regular supporters, and they say, our baby spoke as well. And the best case, which I reason why I tell this story, United States, in the maternity ward, the baby came out in front of the midwives and the doctor, and as soon as the baby came out of the womb, still attached to the umbilical cord, looked around and spoke. But the words he spoke were just amazing. What he said as he looked around was, Oh no, not again. <laughs> That's a classic. And who was the fourth person who spoke when they were born? The Buddha, yeah. Maybe he did. So if you see there's no one in there, there's no one to get reborn anymore. Dear Ajahn, we'll s no, I'm not supposed to talk about spirits. Will, you know what, around Ask for Dhamma talk. If so, how do they come forward? Here's a condition to do so. Thank you. What they do is they write it on a piece of paper and they put it in the box. <laughs> Can spirits write? 
Seems that they can because often they leave messages. Now this is a don't be scared. This is a nice ghost story. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it really is a beautiful one. It's one of my favourite ones. It was here in in I think it was actually in Perth. There was an elderly couple, and they were living in an old people's home. You know, then their family hardly ever visited them. Actually, I think they one of them didn't have a family in Australia. I think. Uh, he said that he had a sister in England somewhere and that's uh, all he said. And because he was a man, elderly man, an elderly lady, lived in the next room to each other, you know, the, the woman would sometimes cook him something and he would sort of fix up things for her. And it wasn't a romantic relationship, it was just like friendship. You know, two old people you know, looking after one another. And when uh, he died, you know, no one knew about where his relations were. He, she'd only heard him say that he had a relation, a sister in England somewhere. And well, they had to do the, the funeral service for him without being able to contact anybody. And she said a few days after the funeral service, she was in bed and she felt no, asleep. She felt somebody stroke her cheek very gently. And she woke up and, of course, first of all, you think it's a burglar. That someone's coming in to, to do you wrong. But she turned on the bedside lamp and there was no one in the room at all. Everything was locked. But what she did have was a piece of tissue paper on her bedside table. And she saw that piece of tissue paper lift up and fall to the floor. There was no wind at all. And she opened up that piece of paper and there were numbers on it. And she rang those numbers, and it was this man's sister. It was very beautiful. You know, the, the man realized that his sister needed to be called and knew that she was very worried about this. And so very gently you know, caressed her and made the piece of paper fall so she would open it up and see it was a telephone number there. And so they managed to tell the sister. So, I mean, those are nice stories, and that's usually what happens. So that's why if they want to talk, they'll write it on a piece of paper. <laughs> Is it okay for lay men, lay women to take their own time to exit from samsara? Some may not want to be still so fast. Thank you so much for your compa compassion. <coughs> of course, no one, could, <coughs> sorry, no one could force you to come out of samsara, but after a while, you think you've had enough. You know, I know some friends, you know, that they finish university and then they go back there. And they just, you know, 30, 40, 50, and they're still at university. They just like the place, they just like studying, they're perpetual, you know, sort of students. And they don't want to leave, which is quite weird. There are some people who are in jail, and they don't want to leave either. They've got used to jail, and they're scared of coming out. So, I like to use those sorts of similes, because we're used to samsara, and even though it's a jail, we don't want to come out. Even though the door's open. No, we don't want to go through because even though this is a bit of suffering, disappointment, at least it's a suffering we know. And we're a bit scared of what happens when we let go. So that's what happens here in this meditation, in this practice. One of the reasons why you don't let go. You're in prison, you're in a jail, but you got used to it. And just like the prisoner, they'd rather stay the whole life and die in jail and go outside into freedom. Sometimes freedom is scary. But you know, whenever you want to, basically, and I haven't told this yet, but you know, it's not your choice. We always think we're in control. This is you know, the understanding of the nature of will. Did you decide to come on this retreat? Did you really? Or were you brainwashed? It was put into your mind as a suggestion by Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> was it really your choice? It looks like it, it seems like it, but it wasn't. You had no choice, you had to come here. You've been brainwashed without knowing it. He, he, he. <laughs> <laughs> So in the end, it's not your choice. You're going to get out of some soul, whether you like it or not. 
When you say insight meditation, do you mean that during meditation you gain certain insights about your life events, etc., you didn't have before? If so, isn't these insights part of thinking, or at least when they arise they come to you uh, as thought? Is it correct? The insight comes first, but we understand it by sort of using thought, using words to describe our experiences. But the insight is you know, much more fundamental than the, <coughs> than the thoughts. The thoughts is just how we explain these things to us. Because there's many things in life which thoughts just cannot describe. Now I'd use an example, a very simple example. Now can you experience the feeling in your bottom right now? Now can you describe that to me? We just don't have a language, not in English or in Mandarin or Hokkien or Bahasa to describe the feeling of you know, when you're sitting down on the bottom. We just haven't got the language for that, but it's real. There's so many experiences in life we haven't got words for. And that's one of the reasons why the words are just so limiting. And why sometimes you get into some very deep meditation, meditation experiences and it's so hard to describe them. You just haven't got the words there. The concepts are not there. I know they, I read this in a book and when I first read this I thought this is crazy, it can't be true. But understanding more about the nature of the mind, maybe it was true. They say when the Indians, and I think it was the country now is Dominican Republic, when the natives there saw Columbus come in his boats, his huge ships, they could not see the ships, even though they were right in front of them. Their eyes could see it, but their mind could not deal with this concept of a ship. So it was right there, but they couldn't see it. The language, the concepts were not there to understand it. So basically, it was not registered in their mind. The eyes could see, but the mind couldn't understand, therefore it didn't register. Fascinating idea. Which is one of the reasons why we miss so much, and when we get into deep meditation, we can learn how to know without these concepts, without the words. And it's a much more beautiful and accurate knowing. So that's what happens sometimes. In insight, we see, and then we try and explain it. And sometimes it's hardly so difficult to explain. Would a meditator die well? How did Ajahn Chah die? He stopped breathing. <laughs> and his heart stopped, that's how he died. <laughs> of course they will die well. The reason why people don't die well is because they're too clingy. They're too attached and they're too afraid. In fact, if you really get into the deep meditations like the jhanas or even to the nimittas, I've mentioned that everybody sees a nimitta sooner or later because you, you see it when you die. Five senses stop working and just like in the near-death experiences you float up towards the light, that's exactly the same as you see in deep meditation, the nimitta experience and you go through the light and depends on how you deal with that. <coughs> it depends on whether you get reborn or where you get reborn. So that's exactly what you're doing in this meditation. You're letting the five senses disappear, suppress them, so it's as if they're dying. And you're going to this beautiful light. This is actually death training. This is a death training camp. You're learning how to die. <laughs> Dying 101 at Jhana Grove Meditation or <laughs> Death Training Retreat Center. And what happens if you do get, this is a, a powerful thing, you do get insight into the nature of the body and the mind because you experience when this five senses, <coughs> so the five senses vanish, when the mind appears, you, you have experience of this. So when that happens for, you know, permanently and you die, you recognize what's going on so you don't get so afraid. You know exactly what's going to happen and you know, when you're prepared and when you know what's going to happen, it takes away a lot of the t stress when you've trained beforehand. And because of that, you know, you, you don't attach to the five senses, you can let them go because you learn how to let them go in deep meditation. Which means you die beautifully, it's no problem at all. And you're not afraid because you know, in those uh, states, it's like you realize this is what dying is like. 
And as most people say, who've had near-death experiences, dying is painful, but death is beautiful. It's a process going to that point to leave the body. That's a difficult one for many people. But actually, once you've passed that point and the, you've left the body, it's blissful, it's beautiful, you're having a great time. Which means people who come back are never afraid of death. Of dying, yes, but not of death. And there's that classic story which I saw on a documentary from the BBC. This woman died on the operating table and floated out of her body and was having a wonderful time. You know, so free, you got no aches, no pains, a lot of bliss, a lot of energy. Oh, it's just so wonderful once you get out of this sick, old, dead, fat body. And she was floating around and having a great time and she met this other spirit who said, it's not your time to die, you've still got unfinished business, you have to go back. And that's when this English girl said, no way, I'm not going back to that old body of mine. And so they had an argument on the psychic plane. Backwards and forwards, you have to go back. No, I am not going. But you must, it's not your time. I don't care, I'm not going back. And had this big argument apparently, and it was only settled when this spirit somehow managed to grab hold of her and throw her back into her body on the operating table and she came alive again. And when she was interviewed by the BBC about the whole experience, you know, it's a wonderful little documentary because you could see her anger towards that spirit when she said, when I die next time, when I do die next time, I'm going to find that guy and you wouldn't believe what I'm going to do to him. What he did to me, sending me back here, never again, I'm going to sort that guy out. <laughs> and I like telling that story because it showed that just how beautiful was the state after death. And I keep on saying, nimittas, you know, the bliss better than sex, the beautiful ecstasy when you leave, you know, the five senses below, the delightful breath and the beauty of this thing. This is what you are experiencing in a deep meditation and that means, yeah, this is what's going to happen to you when you die. Bring it on, as Mr. George W. Bush used to say. <laughs> so it takes away all your fear of death when you get into deep meditation you get to understand what happens, and why it happens, and what it feels like. And once you have the deep meditation, you're not afraid of death at all. Venerable Sir, is it important that we reach jhanas in this lifetime? If not, what will happen? You've still got another two days left. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is that important in life. If you don't reach it in this lifetime, you can have another go in your next lifetime. That's the wonderful thing about Buddhism. No rush, take your time. Does it, <coughs> does it work in this lifetime? You've got endless other lifetimes to catch up. So that's why you can take it easy, just like in this retreat. If you want to sleep, you can sleep. If you want to go for a walk in the forest, walk in the forest. Don't rush. Why are you rushing so fast? This is not Singapore in the rush hour. This is just jhana growth. You can take your time to become enlightened. Because if you go fast, you end up getting nowhere. But if you go slowly, it's amazing how deep you go. So remember, it's being still, being here. It's where you enter the jhanas. Trying to get there, is wasting time. So, is it important to be sure you get jhanas sooner or later, if not in this lifetime? Another one, guaranteed. Otherwise your money back. <laughs> Hope you're not going to ask for your money back from the BF if you didn't get jhana on this retreat. <laughs> Dear Ajahn Brahm, is it possible to see future life in our meditation? In future life, now you can, future is so uncertain because you're always changing things. Now we may have a sort of a future direction, but you can turn left, you can turn right, because the future is work in progress. So it can always be changed. 
Yes, sometimes you can have these images. And did I, <coughs> I think I told this little story in uh, Malaysia in the retreat there last week. My, what was it here? The best friend who um, had three visions. Okay, when I, when I was a monk, you know, the monk sitting next to me because when you ordain, the one who ordains first sits high and then the next one who ordained after you and then the one who ordained after you. So the fellow who sat next to me for about three years, he was an American called um, Jyotiko. And um, he told me that in his life he had these three visions. But first of all, the first vision when he was very young, he'd always have this vision, sometimes in a dream, of his sister drowning in the swimming pool of their family home in Pasadena, in California. And he had that so many times that one day as a young man, maybe 17 or 18, he was sitting by the pool, just lounging, doing nothing, and he started to see this premonition act out. Everything he dreamed, he started to see it happening. And he said because he could, no, he knew what was going to happen next, because of the dream, he took action and saved his sister's life. And he said if he hadn't had that dream, his sister would have died. It was a wonderful thing which you know, he could do. And because of that, the, he said the next time he had a premonition, he was, this was in the hippie area, he was staying in New Zealand in a house of other hippies where they were smoking lots of marijuana, you know, illegal stuff. And he had a dream that the New Zealand police came to the house and arrested them all. And of course he was kicking himself, he never acted on that because that happened and he got deported. <laughs> and he said, I was given the sign but I never did anything. And because those were two premonitions which actually came out to be true, he told me the other premonition which he had was that he would be killed running across the paddy fields of northeast Thailand by invading communist troops. And that was a real possibility. When I was a monk over there, most we all had to register with our, um, our embassies in Bangkok. There was an evacuation plan and most people actually thought that the communists would actually come in from over the border and take the northeast of Thailand. It never happened, but you know, that was the surprise of many people. And he believed that yes, that was going to happen, and he'd be running across the paddy fields trying to escape, because where we were, it was, you know, from where we were to Bangkok was twice the distance as it was to Hanoi. You know, it was <coughs> really close to sort of North Vietnam, and to Laos and Cambodia, the whole lot. In fact, one of our monasteries got shelled you know, by the Khmer Rouge, they actually put shells over the border and it fell into the monastery. And that's how close we were to the Vietnam War. And he really thought he was going to get killed by a bullet in the back of the head running away from the uh, invading communists. And of course that never happened. You know, he disrobed, he got married, and one year after getting married he died in a head-on car crash. And it's a little interesting story because his our wife was holding, he had a baby, he was holding his baby, both of them went through the windscreen of the car, he got immediately killed, and his wife held on to that baby even though she was flying through the air and totally protected it instinctively. So she died on impact on the road, the baby had not a scratch on it. It's amazing, like when you say, just like a mother sacrifices her life for her child, it's instinctive. And she did that as she was flying through the air, she just hit the ground and rolled. The baby was totally protected by the mother. And uh, I was visiting California and this girl came up and said, do you know this guy? It's my dad. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's him. We were the best of mates. And he had a picture of him and also me next to him when we were in Bangkok. And I looked very young <laughs> as he did, very <laughs> thin. <laughs> and that was, uh, he called his, the daughter Meta. So that was Meta. So this was the premonitions. Two came to be totally true, but the third false. 
And this is what happens, we always interfere, things change. So you may have a premonition and it doesn't work. Another premonition it actually turns out to be true. So that's why through meditation you can get premonitions but you cannot trust them, which is the biggest problem. <coughs> so you don't know if it's going to happen or not until after it's happened. Is an ara if an arahat gets cancer and the physical pain is unbearable, will he have mental suffering? Is there any possibility of him committing suicide? Thank you. You will not have mental suffering, but there will still be compassion. And the compassion might be, I don't want to give other people any more problems and troubles. So there's many reasons why people commit suicide and it's not always out of negative emotions. Sometimes it really is out of compassion. I don't want to be a burden on anybody else. So it's not out of negativity towards the pain, but just not wanting to be a burden to anybody. So please tell that to your husband. Darling, you don't want to be a burden to... <laughs> No, 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 I shouldn't go there. Could you please comment about conceit in meditation? Okay, this, uh, this is um, what we call measuring. It's, you know, the, the conceit, the word for conceit in Pali is mana. The word to measure is manati. It literally is what the mind does. It measures, it judges. And the conceit is always judging. And the nice thing about the Buddha, he had the three conceits. I am better than anybody else. And that's the most common one, which we think is conceit. But he also said, I am inferior than anybody else, I am worse. That's also conceit. As is, I am the same as everybody else, that's also conceit. And the truth is, which we cannot judge. And we don't need to judge who's the best, who's the worst. It's just like, you know, if you go into, a, a, say, a high school, <coughs> are the children in grade 12 better than the children in, say, grade 9? They certainly know more and are more skilled, but you can't say they're better or superior. They've just been in school longer, that's all. So can you say that one person's a better meditator than another? You can't judge. Some people may be their first retreat. Other people may be meditating for years. Can you really judge and compare? And of course, that's the problem with manati, judging, comparing, and from there we get this conceit. <coughs> so the nice thing is not to compare yourself, not to judge at all. You are who you are and you're totally unique. There's only one Ajahn Brahm in the world, thank goodness. <laughs> and if you clone me, it'll be totally different. So, and it's only one of you either. So that's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually what we mean by sort of conceit. No judging, no comparing. Dear Ajahn Brahm, when I was meditating this morning, I suddenly feel an extreme energy come to me. I felt a few moments of stillness and I'm amused by this. Is such an experience, external energy, real, possible when one is meditating? Of course, sometimes you can release enormous amounts of energy when you're meditating. Because when you are still, as I've mentioned many times before, when you are still, you're not wasting energy. It's all sort of kept in one place. It builds and builds and builds, and you can create enormous energy just through stillness. Many times, because I do work hard, I get exhausted. And I still remember one time, it was one of those times we had a concert at the BF. Um, I forget what it was, Passage of Time or Opening the Door of Your Heart, I forget which one it was. But Angie wanted me to come for the matinee about two or three o'clock and also for the evening performance. And the only way to come on a Saturday, you know, you, you, you <coughs> uh, do the Friday night talk and you get the Singapore Airlines flight early on the morning. And you know, it's only sort of a five hour flight, but getting to the airport, checking in and all that stuff, it takes a long time. So by the time I landed in Changi, or one o'clock in, in the afternoon or something, 
and go straight to the Victoria Theatre, straight from the airport to the theatre, and you've got to perform and talk to people beforehand, so you can't relax at all. And then after, after the first performance, I was just so tired. I really was exhausted. And all you guys, you went off for dinner, to get some energy inside of you. As for me, I was just, how am I going to you know, do anything for the next um, session in, <coughs> in the evening? But fortunately, I just walked around. There was one of the exits which was locked, which made it a nice little place I could go and hide. And I went down, it was like a little cave, and I meditated while you guys were doing your, your dinner stuff. And it was wonderful. I mean, you meditate there when you're exhausted, be really still, and you start getting energy coming back inside of you. Energized, and after half an hour, I was just ready to sort of to do anything all night. You get a huge burst of energy. That's actually how I work sometimes. You're really tired, you know how to get this inner energy going. So it does work, and you have huge amounts of energy sometimes. It's real mental energy. And it always is accompanied by a lot of joy. So that's the joy and energy of stillness. That's where it comes from. When you know how to turn that on, oh, you're sweet. Dear Ajahn, it is mentioned that spiritually achieved monks can see their past life during meditation. Just say during insight meditation, no, during all meditation. There's no such thing as insight meditation or samatha meditation or any type, it's just meditation, okay? Are you a monk in your past life too? Are you, oh, were you a monk in your past life too? So I know that many people try and trick you <laughs> in, <coughs> into revealing all of your powers and experiences and stuff, but that's one of the rules. We're not allowed to say that. It's the eighth Pajitya rule for monks. You know, even if it's true, we're not allowed to say, you know, if we can see our past lives or if we have any powers at all. <coughs> so, um, where was I a monk in my past life? So I can't answer that, but what do you think? How come I became a monk so early in this life? And I know I still remember the first monk I saw. Now I was a Buddhist, I became a Buddhist through reading books, but I never saw a monk until I was 18. And when I went to the university in Cambridge, it was a Buddhist society, and the first talk I went to, I saw a monk walking up the stairs. And I can still picture that to that this day. It was just a powerful experience. Wow, a Buddhist monk. It was something really resonated with you. So, you know, you can, you can take that for, for what you think. You know, it must be something there. Anyway, <laughs> oops. Uh, choice of diet. I am not persuaded by the explanation regarding vegetarian versus non-vegetarian. You mentioned that it's acceptable so long as you did not plan to have the living being killed. If I walk by a market store selling chicken, I didn't plan the chicken to die, but it's already dead. Why not buy and eat it? Also, regarding dana, isn't it about boundaries? While it is lovely to accept what others offer, it is inconsistent with one's principles. One can, pol can politely decline. Next time, then one would be offered what one would accept, non-meat. You can't be serious about you are what you eat. All life on earth depends eventually on plants. It's a matter of whether we choose to eat lower on the ladder or life or not. Doing so lower on the ladder is more sustainable for the earth. If non-veg food is okay, why does Jana Grove serve vegetarian food? Well, Bodhinyana accepts all food. It's one of the reasons for that. It was, you know, it's part of our Vinaya, you know, our tradition. There was once when um, Devadatta, you know, he was the Buddha's cousin, and he asked the Buddha, can we please make a rule that all monks eat vegetarian food? And the Buddha actually declined that. <coughs> he said no. And one, <coughs> one of the reasons is for that, I, you know, you don't know exactly why he said that, but you know, it's there. And one of the reasons is, is to make monks more easily, and nuns more easily to look after. Because in some places, there just simply is not vegetarian food. And that was in the northeast Thailand when I first became a monk. I was a vegetarian, very strict vegetarian, before I became a monk. 
but sometimes I was an extremist vegetarian. I think I mentioned a story when my girlfriend made me, uh, she invited me, you know, she's going to make me a dinner that evening. I don't know, I think that's another story I said in um, Kuala Lumpur. My girlfriend invited me for dinner, you know, she knew I was a vegetarian, but for somehow or other she forgot and made me a meat dish and I refused to eat it. And that was the end of that relationship. <laughs> And when I look back, I thought that was just such an arrogant, selfish, cruel thing to do. Now this girl had really you know, put her heart into trying to make me something I like, put all the effort into it, and I go along there, there's meat in there, I'm not eating it. And you know, that was, I was, I always say these days, I was kind to animals, but I wasn't kind to people. And that's how I look at myself those days. But, when I was going to become a monk, I was told that, you know, you can't be a vegetarian. You have to eat whatever you're given. And for those first couple of years, you know, in the northeast of Thailand, I had to eat gross food. I would have given anything to have vegetables, but there was no vegetables. For anything, the only green thing we had, we had some mango leaves from the tree. They're really bitter. And the only other thing, oh, was sticky rice, and just whatever crawled on the ground. No fruit, no vegetables, because it was a very poor area of Thailand. And these were farmers who, whatever crawled on the ground, they gave you the very best, the very best beetles and grasshoppers, and they got what was left. You know, there was, uh, you, we, we had, one of the dishes we had was frog soup. Now what frog soup was, there was a big pot and inside it was just like boiling water. There was no salt, there was no onions <coughs> or um, garlic or anything, not even, no, no salt or anything, and just all these frogs floating on the top. As if they just got boiling water and the frogs had jumped in. And you know the Chinese spoons, you know, which monks usually eat out of, the frogs were just big enough just to fit on one spoon. So you just had to, with your rice, put it in your mouth and go crunch. That's, that's what we used to eat. So you see, I wasn't sort of a carnivore, you know, out of desire or craving. It was just all there was. But when I came to Australia, you know, after a little while, I really tried to be a vegetarian. And where I go, this was when Ajahn Chakra was the abbot here. And after a few months, I just gave up. And the reason was I went to one person's house. It reminded me of my girlfriend's dinner. Uh, she made, she was a Laotian girl, she died recently, and she had white rice and every other different type of meat you can possibly imagine. You know, and all the different forms of it. And it was just rice and meat, and there was no vegetables there at all, nor fruit. Because that's what, in that culture, they wanted to offer a monk. So I sat there, just ate rice, but I was trying not to embarrass her. So I'd, you know, I'd put a piece of meat you know, on the spoon, and when she wasn't looking, put it down again. So I never actually put it in my mouth. And I thought, I just can't carry on like this, because it was being selfish. If I was a lay person, I would be a vegetarian. But because you're a monk, you just can't do that, because people eat meat. As long as there's people eating meat, monks will have to eat meat too. If you're all vegetarian, 100%, everyone in Australia, then maybe we could do it. We have to eat what we're given. And we have to eat what other people eat as well. Unfortunately, that's what it's like. If you don't believe me, you can go and become a monk or a nun. And then you'll understand just, you know, what we have to go through. What is the meaning of duality? There are two sides to duality. <laughs> Which one do you mean? This is like a Mahayana concept which comes from thinking too much. Because a lot of time it's an intellectual concept of duality. In the Christian church, duality means just mind and body. So it is a Cartesian duality that yeah, you have the body, the brain and stuff, and there's also this thing called the mind as well, consciousness, soul or whatever. And he said that is the duality 
of you know, the Western science or Western uh, <coughs> philosophy. But putting all that thinking aside, the only time that you have no duality in Buddhism is when you get to what's called a kagata. You know, it's not just one pointedness, it's one summit of the mind where everything comes together and it is literally just one. That is the jhanas. That's the first time that experience coalesces into a single thing. That's why they describe the first jhana. One of its qualities is a kagata, gone to oneness or got to one enormous peak, everything is together. Now now, you know, you can always get the sort of the objectivity. I'm here listening to Ajahn Brahm. That's the sort of the two-ness. But in the jhana, there's no I, there's no what you're watching. Everything is totally um, collected together into a single point. <coughs> That's one way of looking at it. So that is actually the only time you understand non-duality in the jhanas. But of course, that's why also that I mentioned that Christian mystics, when they get into the first jhana, they really think they're one with God. But again, I always say that nothing is better than God. Because you now this oneness starts to vanish and disappear. So you're not one with everything, you are none with nothing. That's the highest. So don't try and be one with everything. Be none with nothing. That's even higher. The goal of Buddhism. <laughs> That's duality. Besides keeping precepts, does being a vegetarian also help one achieve deep meditation? The Buddha ate meat. Ajahn Chah ate meat. And had brilliant meditations. So it sometimes helps if you do it for the right reason. And the right reason you know, should be just out of compassion and kindness and simplicity. But you know, if, for example, that you know somebody does invite you out into their home and they make some mistake and they give you meat, please accept it and eat it. Because be kind to people, not just to animals, and don't be like a an extremist, fundamentalist, dogmatic. I'll only eat vegetables and nothing else. I've heard that Buddhism doesn't include any view of God and has been described as a way of life. Does this? necessarily mean that it denies God, atheists, or just that Buddha did not form any view of this. If the latter, any form of God-knowing or belief is not inconsistent with Buddhism. Some view the bliss of meditation as connecting to the authentic self, which is part of God, and is variously called love, the divine, etc. For me, it matters less the name of the thing and any belief associated with it, although I do not believe God as an external being to oneself than experience. Okay, this is the idea of God. And again, it's one of those words which has so many meanings and it's one of the reasons why I read in Malaysia that the Christians are no longer allowed to use the word Allah for their, their concept of God. <coughs> and it has so many meanings and the usual meaning of God is like a, a being, a first being, creator of this universe and somebody who is like a lord which you have to obey. So, you know, power, you know, authority, creator, that's, that's the, the idea of God, which many modern people just rebel against. Now, number one, you know, there is no evidence, scientific or logical, to actually to say that this universe was created by a being. As far as science is concerned, it's not necessary at all. So much so that sometimes they called it the God of the gaps. Science has made so much uh, information, you know, confirmed information about how this world formed. And they say, well, you know, there's tiny little gaps there. And they said that's where God sort of does his stuff. But it's hardly anything at all. And so, and as science gets more and more knowledge, the gaps shrink, shrink, shrink. And so there's less relevance for God at all. And as far as modern science is concerned, it's very consistent with what was said by the Buddha in the earliest suttas, this is not the first universe. There's been <coughs> thousands, millions of universes before this one, and there will be afterwards. And that is consistent with modern science. Even some years ago, Epstein, Carl Epstein, who 
was <coughs> one of the, I think at UCLA, it was one of the founders of not string theory, but a, a, um, a development from string theory called brain, like membrane theory. And it was predicting just not one universe, but serial universes, one after the other. Some of you may have heard like parallel universes. So which one did God create? And it just, you know, science just makes that creator God just irrelevant. And then you have like the God who's looking over you, controlling everything. And even Saint Augustine is one of the great Catholic Christian um, th theologians. He made this very simple argument, which was, you know, to this day is so compelling. He said, if there is a God, the God can't be all-powerful and compassionate. Can't be. Reason? Because there's suffering in this world. <coughs> because there's suffering. If God was all-powerful, he's got no compassion. He could help people, but he doesn't. Or it doesn't. So he can't be all-powerful and compassionate. If he's compassionate, he can't be all-powerful. If he really loves people, why doesn't he help? Because he can't. And that was actually from, I think, the 5th or 6th century. They were just try, knowing, just by a simple reason, there can't be an all-powerful, all-compassionate God. So that type of being, who you think that God is looking after you, and when you pray to God, that God can answer you. How many millions of Christians and Muslims are there in the world? You know, no, no computer has that amount of gigabytes which can answer so many emails all at once. It's totally ridiculous and impossible. So that type of God, which is very common in the evangelical churches of Singapore, is actually the nonsense stuff. But still people believe in it. You know, oh God the cure. I remember Angie telling me there was one member of the BF and her son was had a uh, a hearing defect. He only had partial hearing. And this um, member of the Buddhist Fellowship in Singapore, this was her son. And you know, the hearing defect, and it could hear sometimes, but you know, not clear enough, was causing all sorts of social problems and also academic problems in school. And so he tried every sort of therapy, nothing seemed to work, so decided to take her to one of these big churches in Singapore to get healed. And she described the ridiculous sort of shenanigans which went on there. You know, she took the kid up to the pastor and the pastor went right up into this kid's ear and shouted, Can you hear me? And the kid said, Yes! A miracle! And everyone stood up, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Jesus is great! And the guy said, Look, he can hear, I can do that. It's just, he's got partial hearing, he's not totally deaf. <laughs> but, it was too late. And apparently, many people were converted because of that stupid thing. Now that is the type of God which is actually dangerous. You know, because it makes people be really, really dumb and stupid. <coughs> so that type of God, absolutely no way. So please, don't be stupid and, and believe it's what is really ridiculous. Now we get to the next type of God, which is like, you know, a principle, not a being. You know, it's, you know something like love or truth or kindness or whatever. And as many Christians, is actually how they, these are not in the evangelical churches, these are the ones that are some of the Anglicans, some of the Methodists, Uniting Church in Australia is very nice. They have, they actually think, they don't, as they say, leave their brain outside the church when they go in. You know, they're, they're wise and they, they believe in a principle like of love, of friendliness, forgiveness, kindness, and that's what they call love. If those of you who've got my latest book, I actually mentioned this story in there. One of my friends was the abbot of the Benedictine, the Catholic monastery to the north of Perth. He died a few years ago. And on one seminar, where you know, we were both talking, at the question time, I was asked a question by a very powerful Catholic called Father Frank Brennan, who's very well known in Australia, and he was appointed by the previous government to try and write up a 
a constitutional amendment on human rights in the Australian Constitution. A very, very well respected man. So when he asked me a question, I realised you, know, you can't give a funny answer, not my usual you know, cheeky, flippant response. And the question was, you know, do Buddhists believe in God? And so my answer was, I said, my friend here, Abbot Placid, I've known him a long time, we've done many things together, and he always tells me that his fundamental belief is that everyone is searching for God. Now it's very easy to reject such things as a Buddhist, but I, this is my friend, so I listen to what he says. So I said, what do Buddhists search for? What you're searching for is peace, freedom, wisdom, insight, contentment. That's what you're here for. So I said, well, all the Buddhists I know, they're searching for love, freedom, respect, kindness, contentment. So if that's what they're searching for, and everyone's searching for God, that must be what God is. And when I said that, this Father Frank Brennan said, it's the best answer I've ever got, thank you. And you can see just what we're doing here, you're getting a principle which each one of you, no matter what religion you are, or atheist, can actually agree on. So that's a nice thing to believe in and worship. Kindness, love, forgiveness. And if we could do that, we wouldn't have all these stupid wars and <coughs> stupid sort of trying to convert each other. We can actually just love each other instead. So that is my idea of how the Buddhists should respond to do Buddhists believe in God. Not in a sort of stupid sense, but in a sort of a sense of a principle which guides us in our life. So that's what I, I, my answer to that question. <coughs> Dear Ajahn Roundness, <laughs> is there such a thing as black magic? Yes, I've seen black magic. I used to give black magic to my girlfriends. It's these chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you mean? If, you, if yes, how do we help someone who's afflicted by black magic or psychic attack? And please tell us a real ghost story you had encountered in the past. I'm not allowed to. People come out again. Now, those were real ghost stories I've told you so far. The joke ghost stories I haven't mentioned yet. But <coughs> as black magic, black magic is incredibly rare. You may think that you've seen a person who's had some magic done onto them, but it's usually some psycho psychological dysfunction. And it's much better to go and take them to a psychiatrist or a doctor than take them to some monk. So please, you know, don't think, oh, it's black magic, black magic. It's too much superstition. Most black magic is so hard to see. There's a couple of cases which I know of it, but it's so, so, so rare. And one of those cases, and I'll tell you this because it's not really a ghost story, it's scary, but it just reinforces what I've been talking about so far. This was one of the disciples of Wat Nana Chat, you know, the, the foreign monastery in Thailand. She was a young girl, maybe in her early 20s. She'd always come to the temple you know, on the, the <coughs> the moon days four times a year, you know, four times a month, the Poya days, the one prayer in Thai. She'd come there and always keep eight precepts, you know, meditate, you know, offer food to the monks. The rest of the time she'd keep five precepts. And one morning she was just washing her face and she looked in the mirror and she never saw her face. She saw the face of a monster. And this was not a crazy girl, you know, she was a very good uh, woman, intelligent, and when she saw this, that freaked her out. Now in time, when anything like that happens, they go and see the monks. And what the monks said, you know, well, you know, this is, must be serious stuff. You know, we'll go to your house to do some chanting you know, and have the meal for the morning. And they brought one of Ajahn Chah's chief monks to actually to go with them. <coughs> and as it happened, during the meal, one of the other people in the house went into a trance, they fell unconscious. And when they woke up, they weren't speaking in their own voice, they'd been possessed by the spirit. And the senior disciple of Ajahn Chah just asked, who are you, who are you, what do you want? And it turned out, you know, through this interrogation, 
that this was like a demon who had been uh, was owned by this one of these black magic peddlers who had been sent to kill this girl. And the reason was that there was a boy who wanted to marry her. She refused. She didn't like him. And he thought, well, if she doesn't marry me, I will kill her. And she hired one of these black magicians to kill her. And this demon, this monster, she, he said, I've been following this girl for about two years. And I just can't get close to her because of her eight precepts and five precepts. And the monk replied to the, the demon who possessed this, this other woman, said, you never will be able to get close to someone like that. They're more powerful than you are. And the demon said, yes, yes, that's what I've been trying for two years. But if I don't kill her, I will have to die. And the monk said, look, it's much better than you die than you kill somebody else. And the monk gave this demon the five precepts. And then the woman went unconscious and woke up again. Basically, the demon died. But you know, he died taking the five precepts from a good monk, so he'd get a good rebirth. And that's you know, a, true five, a true story of the sort of possession. And it reinforces what I've been saying to you all along. If you keep five precepts or eight precepts, black magic cannot harm you at all. They can't get close to you, they can't get in there to do anything. So that's a true story which happened in, in Thailand many years ago. Dear Bhante, where does the ego come from? The ego comes from all of your willing and controlling. The more you try and control and will and strive, the bigger is your ego. That's what feeds it. Do babies have an ego? <laughs> you bet. <laughs> Or do we develop it at a later stage in life? No, of course babies have an ego. They come into life with an ego. <coughs> That's why, you know, sometimes they can be very selfish, self-centered. What happened to the Vietnamese monk, Venerable Kemavaro? Oh, he's over in Wat Buddha Dhamma. About a week ago or something, I gave a call to him, make sure he's okay. So he's over in Wat Buddha Dhamma, outside of Sydney, doing very well. Dear teacher, we're all going to meditate well today because we're all so happy. The lunch is good. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to make it happen. What did you have for lunch today? What? Noodles. Noodles and ice cream. Did you put the ice cream on top of the noodles? <laughs> That's what I had to do once. You talk about vegetarian food or other food. Because sometimes, you know, you have one bowl and everything goes in the same bowl. And I remember having, well, it was a type of noodles, spaghetti, I suppose, strawberry ice cream. I tried to put it, you know, on the other side of the bowl, but it fell right on top of the spaghetti. So spaghetti with strawberry ice cream on top. Have you ever had that? So how do you know it doesn't taste nice? You should try it. I tried it. It doesn't taste nice. <laughs> it tastes awful. <laughs> but that's what you have to do as a monk sometimes. <laughs> so the lunch is so good. Asian food, ice cream and big fat chocolate bars. Thank you, compassionate Buddha and Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> Look, don't you believe in the law of karma? So if you meditate well, you keep all the precepts, and you don't talk so much, <laughs> you may get another nice lunch tomorrow. <laughs> Otherwise, there'll be more cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I often get spontaneous insights, not while meditating, but doing mundane activities, e.g. hanging laundry. So what you should do is, there's a lot of laundry to be done here. <laughs> Could you please tell Dania and you can do all the cleaning and all the laundry on Saturday? And who knows, you may get lots of insights. <laughs> do Mondays, mundane activities such as hanging laundry, walking down the streets, doing nothing in particular. Are these reliable? Is it because I'm in present moment awareness? Sometimes that you'll notice that after the retreat finishes, sometime later insights come up. But if you really are wise, you'll trace them back to what happened here. You know, meditation, that's where the seeds were planted. 
and later on they come to fruition another time in your day or in your life. And it's amazing, because once this retreat is finished, it's not finished. You may go back to Singapore or Malaysia and you're doing something else and suddenly, oh, I understand what he meant by you know, non-duality or whatever. The insight will come up, it takes a while to work its way through the system. So the retreat doesn't stop on Saturday, it carries on when you go home. Dear Ajahn, I had a major breakthrough yesterday. After so many days I was able to feel calm and peaceful during my meditation when suddenly I felt my body being pulled to the left. It was like a force gently pulling me to the left. It has never happened before and all the while I was mindful and calm even when my body started to slowly lean towards the left uh, following this invisible force. It was really weird, I didn't understand why. Then I leaned to about 30 degrees. That's when it happened. I farted. <laughs> That's what it says here. I'm not making this up. And it finished. That's the best letting go that has happened to me. <laughs> you crazy people. <laughs> See what I have to put up with? It's my karma because I give you worse. <laughs> Dear Ajahn Brah, we, <laughs> we meditate to find peace and happiness and cultivate wisdom, right? Must we see limiters to reach jhana in order to become enlightened? That's a serious question, yes, you have to get jhanas to become enlightened. Yes, I haven't told the story of, you may know that story of insight, the frog and the lake. You know, there was a tadpole who lived in a lake, and the tadpole, uh, he was a very, she was a very smart girl. You know, the frogs came and taught meditation retreats in the lake. She went to every meditation retreat. She actually learned Abhidharma by these very wise Burmese frogs. <laughs> and all the time, you know, she, she thought she, und and she went to chemistry school as well, so she knew that water was H2O and she knew you know, Nama, Rupa and just the four elements and what exactly water was according to the Abhidhamma and she could meditate in the, the lake on water but do you think the tadpole would ever know what water was? When she was born in the water, lived all her life in the water, slept in the water, you know, ate in the water, swam all her life in water can a tadpole ever know what water is? And then one day a little tadpole she grew some legs and some things from her front. It wasn't breasts, it was little legs, arms coming out. And she became a frog. And one day, the tadpole, now a frog, just jumped. And it landed on a very weird place. It was very scary at first, there was no water around. It was outside the lake on dry land. And that was the weirdest experience she'd ever known totally different than everything she'd ever known. Really weird and quite scary too. But then she reflected, something is missing. Something which has always been here all my life is no longer here. Water. Now, tadpole, now a frog, can understand what water is. Only when it's left disappeared. Now that is a wonderful simile of why you need jhanas to become enlightened. If you haven't left the five senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, you can't understand them. <laughs> no matter how many times you reflect on seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, no matter <coughs> what you read about them, you don't know what they are because you've been born in these things, they're always there, this body is always there. Because of that you don't understand it. Which is why people think it's all happiness and fun. But one day, you little tadpoles, you will grow these beautiful legs, delightful breaths and limiters, and you will jump. And you'll be in jhana. Wow, now that is so weird, like nothing you've ever experienced before. And I mean that, totally different. And you will notice something is missing. In the first jhana, your body is missing. 
You can't feel your legs even if you wanted to. You can't hear sounds even if someone shouts at you. It's totally gone. Now you've got an idea of what the five senses and the body are only through the first jhana. <coughs> In the second jhana, your will goes. This choice, this decision making, this controller totally vanishes, it's not there anymore. You can't decide to do anything, you are totally frozen. Sometimes you don't exercise your will, but it's always there for you if you want to. But here, there's no will left. Now you can understand what this will is. And why I told you, you had no choice but to come here for this retreat. No choice at all. You think you did, that's the illusion. Once you get into the second jhana, you say, my God, Ajahn Brahm was right. This will is not me. Because now it's disappeared. Now you can understand what it is. Those are examples of why you do need jhanas. Otherwise, you may think you know, but you never will. That is why the eighth factor of the Eightfold Path was jhanas. And if jhanas weren't necessary, he didn't have to do all this work to get jhanas. The Buddha, in his great compassion, would have taught a sevenfold path. The eightfold path is there because every one of those eight factors, including virtue, keeping precepts, is necessary. That's why. So, <coughs> jhanas are necessary. Can you give us a deep talk tomorrow? Well, I've almost started one. I am very curious what you said at your deep talk which kept the BF brother sleepless for a few nights. Don't get me wrong, I love your jokes too. And afterwards he said, I prefer your jokes no matter how many times I've heard them because at least I can get to sleep that night after a joke. So maybe see how it goes tomorrow. A Bante once told me that if one is ordained as a monk or a nun then they will have lesser rebirth into samsara. That, <coughs> sorry thus higher chance to get into enlightenment, as monks and nuns have more peace and discipline in their practice. Does it mean that a lay person will have many rebirths and longer than taken to reach Nibbana? No, it doesn't matter if you're a... Well, it does, it's easier as a monk as long as you're a good monk and keep the precepts. They had a very good simile in the Visuddhi Magga. He said, like a monk is like someone who rides on an elephant. A lay person rides on a, on a horse. So, you know, you can actually sort of go more safely on an elephant through the jungle than on a horse. But, they said, if you fall off a horse, you don't break as many bones as if you fall off an elephant. So, yes, a monks can go faster and deeper, but if they make mistakes, they fall further than you do. Which is why that if there's a bad monk who breaks precepts, and unfortunately they do, then they're in big trouble. Because when they break the precepts, it's much worse karma than when you do the same thing and break your precepts. They fall much further. So yeah, there is a good thing about being a monk, but there's also many dangers as well. And, okay, we can tell the story. This is from the suttas. This is about <coughs> the lady Sumana. She was this devout, simple wife of a farmer but a very devout Buddhist. And when she saw two monks you know, walking, uh, you know, just wa <coughs> wandering around, and she invited them to take some alms food, and she filled their bowls with whatever she could find. And it was only two or three days before the rains retreat started. And so she asked them, Venables, have you got a place to stay for the rains? And they said, no. And she said, please, I invite you to please come and stay close to my hut. There's a meadow by a river close by, I know it very well. My husband can build you a simple hut each so you can have some solitude. And I will feed you every day, you know, whatever food you like. And I'll even just wash your robes for you so you don't have to do a thing. So you can just meditate for the three months so you can just really go for enlightenment. And the monks agreed. And so for three months, these, this woman, she worked so hard getting the best food she could possibly get, finding out what these monks like, and even so they didn't have to worry about anything, washing their bowls and washing their robes for them. 
And she was so happy to do that. And after the range retreat finished, off they went. Some years later, she died. And when she died, she was reborn in this heaven called the Ram, because such a beautiful, kind lady. And when she was up there, she started thinking, I wonder what happened to those two monks. And when she, I think it's the Tower realm she was reborn in. <coughs> when she thought about those monks, and I wonder where they've been reborn. And very quickly, with that thought, she found them in the next level below her in the realm of the four great kings. And she was so upset. What were those two monks doing all that range retreat? Here am I, we're working really hard and I've been, had a better rebirth than they have. So she went down you know, one level in the heaven realms to those two monks and my goodness, she scolded them. You lazy good-for-nothings, I slaved for three months looking after you, cooking for you, and washing all your robes, and you must have been really lazy and doing nothing because here am I born in a much higher realm than you have, you scallywags. And according to the story, one of those monks regained mindfulness, sati. And what that meant was also not just you know, being aware, it also means in part of remembering the Dharma, remembering what was going on, basically woke, waking up. And he remembered the Dharma and immediately, you know, he apologized and got, um, disappeared from that realm and got reborn in the Tusita realm. And the other one said, ah, oh, it's only a woman, and just totally ignored her and stayed in that realm. But that was a case where there were monks having all the opportunities, didn't do half as well just as a simple woman who would just, now simple, not be, I'm not demeaning women, but a woman with a simple lifestyle, you know, being just the wife of a poor farmer. It's nothing to do, you know, with your station in life, but it's how you use, you know, what you've got. <coughs> so, you can do it if you wish to. It's totally up to you. Uh, <coughs> just because you're ordained as a monk or nun does not make you special. It's how you practice as a monk, how you practice as a nun, how you practice as a lay person. That's really important. Next question. What is the difference between intelligence and wisdom? Buddhists seek wisdom through meditation. Intellect seeks intelligence through education. Which is better? Once there was a professor who was so intelligent and he knew everything about every subject. He was one of these, they call him polyglots. Now this is, no, this is a real English word. It means, you know, you just, your wisdom is so extensive and so wise because he spent all his time with his nose in books learning. And for, you know, his, his exercise and for his fun, he would go be debating other philosophers, because that's you know, where they get a bit of fun, to find out who was the wisest. And he debated every well-known intellect in his country, and he was so sharp and so knowledgeable, he defeated everybody. Until one said, why didn't you try debating a Buddhist monk? Have the battle between intellect and wisdom. And so he accepted. And so with a large number of students, he went to visit this monastery to have a debate with one of these old, wise Buddhist monks. <coughs> Any professor should know, steer well clear of Buddhist monks because they always lose. So <coughs> it's an old story, you probably remember this. He went to see the Buddhist monk and before they started debating, the host, the monk, had to look after the guest, the professor. So, gave him a cup of tea. And as he was pouring the tea into the cup, when the cup was full, the monk carried on pouring. And the professor thought, oh, the monk must be old. He may be eyesight not so good. So he said very politely, monk, my cup's full. You don't, can stop pouring now. And the monk looked up and smiled and carried on pouring. <laughs> and then I said, my cup's full. It's going all over the table. And the monk just smiled. You stupid old fool! It's going all over the floor now! And the monk just smiled until he emptied the whole teapot. 
And the professor stood up and said, you stupid old mug, I've come all this way to debate some interesting and important matters and you can't even pour out a cup of tea, you imbecile. What's the point of debating with you? At which point the monk stood up and said, Professor, you are just like this cup, you are so full that no one can pour anything in. <laughs> it's a famous old said story. And the professor was wise enough to admit he'd been beaten and just went down and bowed. You win. That's the difference between wisdom and intellect. Intellect, knowledge is you're so full, no one can teach you anything. Wisdom is being so empty that you can understand new things all the time. You're empty, there's no self left there. Nice story anyway. But don't try that in our kitchen because Daniel will have to clean up the floor <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> How to have a wedding reception in a Buddhist way? So we, I've never had that question before. In Singapore it's usually done in a hotel, meaning the couple would have to reserve the place and choose food that they would like to be served. If it's a non-vegetarian we won't know whether there's any possibility of killing animal involved in the process. But if it's a vegetarian meal, guests might not like it and eventually they could be wasted. What's your best solution for this? <coughs> you know there are some restaurants in Europe, I've heard, I've read about, and maybe you have them in Singapore, where you go into the restaurant and they're totally dark, you can't see anything. <laughs> have you got those restaurants in Singapore? <laughs> but apparently the, the waiters, they wear these, these night vision goggles so they can actually see, so they don't pour the soup all over you, it actually goes in the bowl and you're sitting there and you can't see your food, so you just eat it. Now that'd be wonderful for a wedding reception, <coughs> because then it doesn't matter what you're, you're serving, no one actually knows. They just actually depend on the taste, so that way you can get away with serving really cheap food. <laughs> and a bit, that'd be even, even better for the, actually the wedding ceremony as well, to have it totally dark, so you know, the bride wouldn't have to wear makeup, you know, because you couldn't see anyone, anyway. you wouldn't have to spend all this money on expensive dresses, do it in totally dark. The priest would have the night vision goggles, so you know, can actually put the rings on people's fingers, <coughs> and everything else is dark. It also means that, you know, if you're too busy, no one will notice if you didn't turn up for the wedding. <laughs> There's a lot of advantage in having these, these totally dark weddings. Does that make sense? So what's your best solution for this? Oh, just, you know, just go to a multi-restaurant where some people can have vegetarian food and some people can have meat food or whatever, in a wedding reception. What do you have the wedding receptions for it? anyway? Why are you celebrating these things? <laughs> There's a lot of suffering in marriage. <laughs> anyway. Thank you so much for your selflessness by spending so much valuable time with us. Please advise, is it right to judge somebody and deem that that person is not worthy of one's friendship? No, of course, you shouldn't judge anything. All of us come in all shapes and sizes. We carry with us different personalities, different perspectives of life. No two persons are identical, so isn't it so important to celebrate one's differences? Yeah! Learning to give and take, learning to use one's heart to perceive and appreciate one another, Learning to understand one another, is this part of kindness and compassion that Buddhism advocates? Of course! However, one of the retreatants here chose to judge and walk away from the friendship. Of course, this is all easy way out, but to the other party who has not done anything to harm or hurt this friendship, this is a fair action to take. Ajahn, kindly please advise. So they walked out of a friendship, remember? Good, bad? No. Who knows? If they walk out, you can't do anything about it, maybe it's better that for persons like that, they're not your friend. Who knows? They may open the path for even a better friend to come into that gap. So that's why when these things happen, you can't do anything about it. People are like that, people have their defilements. So if you can do something about it, do it. If you can't do anything about it, it's not a problem, let it go. <coughs> and it's the other person's karma. Look, I mean, we had the now when I ordained bhikkhunis, I had some really good friends and they got really crazy. 
And you know, I, I went to see two of those friends last Ju July in Thailand. You know, I, and I said, no, I'll come and see you. No, forget about this whole thing. It's about four years ago. Actually, we, oh, we had the anniversary just a couple of days ago. What day is it today? The 24th? Oh, October the 22nd. It's actually, actually Bamani's birthday. Did you remember that? Yeah, yeah, we didn't put toast down. Oh, we don't toast out. Okay. <laughs> so the 22nd of October 2009 was the, an was the, the date. So it's four years now. It's four years, for goodness sake. Let it go. But they said, no, we're not ready to meet you, Ajahn Brahm. But I went close by to the monastery anyway. And actually, for the monastery, you know, you know Ajahn Ganha? He's the guy who patted the snake on the head. And then in the, opened the door of your heart, I went to see him. He said, there's a monastery over there. They're not here. They've gone away for today. They're afraid you might go and visit them. <laughs> oh, that's sad. That's stupid. But if they walk away, you know, that's their problem, not my problem. So you just let it go. You know, don't allow other people's stupidity to cause you suffering. That's one of my lovely sayings which I take to heart. I never allow other people's actions, good or bad, to control my happiness. I'm going to be happy no matter what other people do. I'm not going to allow them to cause me suffering. My happiness is my concern. What other people do, whatever you want to do, I may not approve of it, but it's your karma. But I'm not going to suffer because of the stupidity of others. Why do you allow that to happen? Sometimes people are so stupid, they do wrong, bad karma, and you're the one who suffers. Isn't that ridiculous? So just let it go. I find aging quite confronting. I've been quite attached to my youth. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> oh, it's really awful again. Now, as a monk, when you get older, you get more venerable. And this is again one of my sayings. You know that people say that life begins at 40 and nowadays they say 50 is the new 40. But for monks or nuns, life begins at 70 for a holy man. That's when you really get into holiness. You know, I'm only 62, so you know, I'm just too young to really be holy. But give me another eight years <laughs> when I start to really look old. And that you get really attracted then by people because these old holy men, they're really awesome and cool. Like, you know, who would ever go to a young holy man? And then at 26, even though they're maybe fully enlightened and psychic powers, when you got 27 and 28, they can't be holy. But like an old man, especially with a long white beard and just, you know, lots of wrinkles and stuff like that. Now that's really cool, that's a holy man. So, I, you know, no matter how wise or kind I can be, I can't really be holy until another eight years when I'm 70. <laughs> so that's when life begins as a holy man. <laughs> So if you're in our profession as monks, you, know, you want to get old quickly because you get more respect. Isn't that so, you young monks down there? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, big, it's a big something, how I've related to others. And it's a big party. Okay, how I relate to others and dis despise myself or denied myself or something. Seeing my hands and feet aging, my body shape changing, and bones getting creaky, etc., is confronting. I wish I could press the stop button. Any tips on how to age gracefully? It's great being old, being senior. So, you know, the more old you are, the less work you have to do. That's usually when people get to about 50. They're smart people, they retire and become consultant. <laughs> that was my plan. I want to retire as abbot and be consultant abbot. <laughs> so you take no responsibility and just spend your life telling other people what to do. <laughs> but I, I, they haven't got me on that so far. So, and you get these old age cards, you get Meals on Wheels. <laughs> Actually, monks, we get Meals on Wheels every day. The, all the meals come in cars. So some meals on wheels. Even these young monks get meals on wheels. <laughs> and what else do you get? Uh, I remember this old monk, he was, he was the abbot of the, the uh, Thai temple in London, Buddha Padipa. 
And he said the English government was so nice, even though he was you know, half Thai, but he'd been in England a long time, got permanent residence. When he became 65, he got this pension card and he got free travel on the London Underground. And he said, now after the dana you know, was finished early in the morning, he'd just go up and just tour around London for free. He said, it's so wonderful being old. <laughs> you get this free travel and stuff. So there's many advantages of being old. You know, you can forget things. You know, when you, you really remember them, but you know, when you, you, know, you said you were going to do something, you don't feel like doing it, you say, oh, I forgot. <laughs> and they actually accept that as an excuse. You know, that's what, what I do. Sometimes I just write and say, don't, remember to, don't forget to come here at a certain time. So I forgot. So I'm 62, what do you expect? <laughs> so sometimes, there's all sorts of advantages. And also, you can eat whatever you like, because, you know, at 62, you're going to die soon anyway, so what's the matter? <laughs> you, don't, you don't care about your health anymore. Anyway, those are some of the advantages of getting old. When you said listless yesterday, did you mean restless? I think listless is also means restless, doesn't it? I thought listless means little energy. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, okay, I got that wrong. But I, I forgot, because, you know, I forgot what listless means, because... <laughs> I'm getting old. <laughs> I a little energy, but you sound like you meant, yeah, too much energy, yeah. So, yeah, it's true. If you've got too little energy, sometimes, you know, be more still and you get lots of energy coming up. And, you know, make sure you're resting enough and eating enough. Interestingly, when I first became a monk in Northeast Thailand, you know, I had little energy. And I went up to one of the monks, who's under his name was, he's dead now, but I went up to him and said, look, I just feel really tired all the time, I've got not much energy, can you teach me some meditation or some trick, some tai chi or something to get some energy coming up? You know what he said? He said, I've been seeing you, you're not eating enough rice. <laughs> it is a simple solution which you didn't think about. Sometimes the answers are so simple you just can't see them. So I ate more rice and my energy came up. Obviously, if you haven't got enough, enough fuel in the car, <laughs> it's not going to get you anywhere. So if you're listless, look at your food intake. Maybe you need to take a bit more you know, to get some energy up. So look at simple solutions, first of all. I vote for more ghost stories. How could that woman know she was marrying a ghost? How can you tell a ghost if you saw one? That's the point, you can't. The person sitting next to you on the aircraft could be a ghost. <laughs> and that has happened. Have you ever read that book, I think Flight 747 over the Everglades? It's a very well documented story. There was <coughs> a, plane, a plane crash in the United States, it's many, many years ago, in Florida, and everybody died in a plane crash. But because it was in swamps, they managed to salvage a lot of the plane and they used it for spare parts. And strangely, every plane which had a spare part from the, the, the plane in which crashed, they had some of the ghosts appear. And this was well documented that someone was flying on a plane and they had this man, you know, was in, in the captain's uniform, sitting next to them on the flight, and they thought it was just one of the captains which is, you know, going from one place to another to part of the next plane. And the flight attendant came past and recognised him because she'd been on a flight with the captain before. He said, you're dead! <laughs> At which point he vanished. And that really, really scared the passenger in the next seat. So, is there any flight attendants from Singapore Airlines here? <laughs> You're married to a captain? No, okay. James, the captain. James, where is he? Oh, there's a the captain over there, yeah. So there you go. Has that ever happened to you? You've seen a dead flight attendant on a flight? That's a very famous story. So the thing is, you don't know until something happens and they just suddenly disappear. I think, my goodness, that was a good. Sorry? Maybe he's gone. Yeah. Can you disappear? <laughs> No, okay, it's not a ghost. <laughs> but they're all kind of ghosts, so don't have to worry about them. So anyway, that's how you know. Last question, because it's getting late. 
Dear Ajahn, for the first time I am told that right effort means courage. Brilliant. Are there any more of the Eightfold Path that are not accurate? Yes. One of the most inaccurate ones is the eighth factor, which most people call right concentration. It is not concentration. <coughs> it means right stillness. And what, what happens? Where these things came from? It was mostly this man, Prof Professor Rice Davids, you know, who went to Sri Lanka, was one of the district officers, and took an interest in the culture, learned basic Pali from a monk, and when he went back to England, he was the first translator. And the first translator, <coughs> translator tried his very best you know, to get some good translations from these Pali words. And you must praise him. His translation for sati being mindfulness was brilliant. And that's still used these days. But concentration was a big mistake. <coughs> but it stuck. And because people think that this Samadhi, meditation, means concentration. They try too hard. And they, they stuff themselves up with all this force. Now if you translate that, not as concentration, but stillness, which is a far more accurate translation, it changes a whole way of meditation and regarding you. are not forcing, because you know you can't be still if you force. Stillness has to come from letting go allowing things to settle down. And I noticed that many years ago, and <coughs> every Rains retreat we get a couple of people from the United States. One is a tenured professor at MIT. And when I was saying this, she actually got out from the, the Chinese versions of the suttas, the words you know, for samadhi in the Chinese version, and it's guan shu. Now, of course, I probably pronounced that totally wrong, but <coughs> guan is the same word as guan yin, means looking, observing, and sure was the word for silent or still. No, it's for stillness, sorry. So, you know, I, maybe it's got another pronunciation, it means observing still, was the word in the, the Chinese arguments. And she said, you're absolutely correct, Ajahn Brahm, nowhere does it mean concentration in the Chinese version? It just means stillness. And that mistranslation has caused a lot of trouble for so many meditators. When you call it stillness, it changes the ball game. So don't try and concentrate. <coughs> this is not a concentration camp. <laughs> <laughs> it's a stillness camp, a happy camp. So that is one of the most important. Okay, that's the last question. At last. <coughs> well, you make me work hard. Tomorrow night, Ajahn Mali will answer all the questions. So for, na for now, we can have a nice three sadhus. <laughs>